Well, welcome back, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I certainly enjoyed the drillers discussion. I hope you all did too that were here. So this afternoon, we're going to start with um, more quote stories from the field. Um, it's uh, cooperation and problem solving during well assessments. Uh, as you may or may not know, um, our funder for the private well class is RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, and their six regional affiliates are all doing um, what I call boots on the ground uh, work in their respective states, uh, which cover their six regions, cover the rest of the, the whole country. Um, they're doing uh, workshops and well assessments and other uh, providing other support for well owners around the country. And the well assessments are a, a pretty comprehensive tool uh, to do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, evaluation of a well if you're familiar with sanitary surveys, we kind of modeled it after a sanitary survey to start with uh, that are done for community water supplies. And um, it's an opportunity to really educate a well owner one on one and provide them with information to help them either fix issues, understand what their risks might be and all those sorts of things. So I've uh, we asked um, the regional uh, our regional folks if they would um, share a story today and then we can talk about um, whatever you want to at the end as far as uh, if you've got questions for them or want to know more about the well assessment uh, these folks are arguably the uh, four of the six experts on how to do uh, these well assessments they've done more than probably anyone else in the country um, me included so um, our first speaker today is William Hood um, William's been at uh, Communities Unlimited uh, for almost four years his background is in water distribution and wastewater collection he uh, is also the private well lead. And um, so with that, William, you're on. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I will share a short story that we Communities Unlimited experienced in a rural community in Tennessee. Um, I think the scenario is a good one to share, in my opinion, because it, it shows many different aspects of what we do and the different ways we can assist private well owners. And I also found it interesting, someone that uh, is a character in this story uh, is a participant, Judy Manners with Tennessee Department of Health. I don't know if she's on right now, but uh, she she was later earlier, um, but I thought that was, that was cool that she's on. So our staff in Tennessee, if you wanna to move to the next slide, was contacted by a concerned well owner in Whitwell, Tennessee. I'm sorry, Whitwell, Tennessee. I was corrected many times while I was there. It's spelled Whitwell, but it's it's Whitwell. Uh, she and her husband were concerned about what was in their water due to smell and sediment. And she felt like they, they didn't have any options about what they could do with their water quality. Uh, if it was impacting their health, they felt like they were stuck. and um, so she, she contacted Andy Chiodo, our, our Tennessee state coordinator, who then got in touch with Tennessee Department of Health. And from there, we planned a site visit to check out the surrounding area, identify potential contaminants, and have Tennessee Department of Health do a wide array of tests on any well owners of wells in the area who wanted the testing done. And after getting a few of the original callers, neighbors on board, we started doing testing on the community's wells, well water. And you can see on this map, the blue pins on the map are wells that we completed tests and assessments on. The, so we completed six assessments in this little strip of uh, houses. There were, there were several who, as always, aren't, were kind of iffy about it. They heard the the words EPA and Tennessee Department of Health and wanted to close their door, but there were there were six that were wanting to work with us and and have an assessment done. The regions outlined in green were agricultural usage areas that I identified. You can see that on the north side of the map. Um, it looks like mostly grain, so I would assume that there were chemicals being sprayed on it. So I, I made sure that we noted that. And then the red areas where are, uh, are areas where I could identify that there were cattle being pinned there, grazing. Um, and so pretty important to note that as well. On the next slide, you'll see that uh, E. coli and coliform bacteria were both present on this 
uh, lab analysis that was performed by Tennessee Department of Health. And first thing that came to my mind was the amount of cattle around in the area. And frankly, the E. coli and coliform bacteria were present in most of the samples taken this day in this community. And it was very eye-opening for the well owners who many had no idea they had a contamination issue. On the next slide, one contamination in particular that was a surprise to all the well owners was the presence of radon. And was a surprise usually to most people who don't know that radon is there. But in this example in particular, it wasn't a big worry, though the presence of radon is never a good thing. The big issue again was the bacteria presence. Going back to the previous results, you can see there were some individuals who did exceed the EPA limits of radon. So to the previous slide, that showed a count of 881, whereas the MCL is 300. So not only is radon in this quantity detrimental to health when consumed in drinking water, the presence of radon in your water also means it is very likely that radon gas is in the air as well. So you're breathing it in, whether seeping out of the ground or evaporating out of water that you boil to cook or out of your shower. Mm -hmm. Because of Tennessee Department of Health's um, cooperation with us and these well owners and us working together, their great testing and their great testing abilities. We were able to catch this and help recommend treatment solutions as well as recommending they have their air quality tested by a professional. So if you go on to two more slides over. For one well owner, though they were super grateful and glad that we were able to share knowledge and recommendations and test their water and assess their well. We were able, they wanted to go a step further. They asked the bold question of whether or not we could assist them with connecting to the local water department. Because she knew the water system close by had a, had a line that was less than a mile away. And if they could extend that to them, it would provide their community, them and their community with re reliable water that would not they wouldn't have to worry about testing it. They wouldn't have to worry about um, buying a filtration system or treatment system and maintain that treatment system. And all in all, the treatment, purchasing the treatment system and then maintaining it and then testing all of that would probably be pretty close to the water bill. And that was their, their, their thoughts. And I, I didn't have anything to say against it. Um, and after all, not everyone wants to, to, to do that, even though I'm on a city drinking water and I wish I had a, a private well. <laughs> but a visual of what she was telling me is represented by the yellow line. And obviously that's not what they would have to do, but it is a representation of what they could do, the city drinking water system, to extend a water line to these well owners from where they know there is a drinking water line. And so it wouldn't be that difficult, but I made sure to point out to, to the well owner that um, this would be very expensive and it would be something that would have to make sense financially for the water system. And a lot of other scenarios would have to come into effect and play out correctly for it to be a thing. Somebody told me one time that, and this isn't accurate, but to, lay a water main it costs approximately one million dollars a mile and i've seen that be i've seen that be pretty close uh to being true and uh i told this well owner that and she understood that it, it, it could possibly not work out <laughs> but since i have experience with these sort of regionalization style scenarios i immediately told the well owner that if this came to fruition it would be a long time and what the most important thing to do would be to focus on the immediate situation at hand. And that is the radon and the coal form bacteria. You need to address those immediately um, and have that be something pursuing the community water system, the community, um, the municipal water system later, uh, if you still want to do that. She called me later and was 
pretty adamant about pursuing the community, the municipal water system. So I recommended that she get her neighbors on board and do what citizens are supposed to do when they want to see change in their community. And that is get on the agenda at the city council meeting, show up and let their issues and wants be known. And they did that. They contacted uh, not only the the city council, but also a news outlet. Uh, they tossed the idea around and hopefully we'll see these well owners get what they want. Um, so like I told them, it will be a long process. So in this scenario, we were able to identify potential contaminant, contaminant sources as well as actual contaminants for most of the well owners in this community. But then share the results to the ones who are elected to participate. We also provided next steps for these well owners and gave them valuable information that could potentially be life saving. And most of the well owners we spoke to had no idea they were being exposed to these things as as usual when I when I do well assessments. So the knowledge we alongside with the trusted Tennessee Department of Health were able to give was life changing to these well owners. And though it didn't end with this crazy outcome. Um, usually what we do is is pretty significant and uh, just wanted to share this story with you guys. Great. Thanks, William. Um, so, Cindy, we don't have your feed up. So you want Hideyuki to run your slides? Oh, there it is. Okay. Well, he brought it up. Cindy, does that work for you? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, so Cindy Brooks is uh, with the Great Lakes Community Action Partnership. Um, she's the private well lead for GL uh, CAP. And based in Ohio, but she covers, uh, well, all those folks cover a number of states. Cindy's close to us because she covers Illinois. Uh, she's a watershed specialist uh, in her previous work, and she joined our CAP, uh, or GL CAP, seven years ago. So, Cindy, it's all yours. Thank you, Steve. Um, so today I want to share with you some experience I had working with some renters. Not that's, in this case, it wasn't the well owner themselves. And so I'll start out by um, setting the scene for you a little bit. Received a call last December from um, actually from a community college with a mother online that was frantic. She has a four month old child. The water is running black. Um, as you could see, maybe in the entry slide and i'll show you a little bit what she was meaning but she continued to tell that when they run the water on a continual basis the house starts smelling of rotten eggs um so i mean i had all kinds of bells and whistles going off in my head when i returned the call and she's sharing this with me again um iron and manganese came to mind right away after working with communities um, so that that was kind of in my thoughts. Um, sulfur levels were questionable, um, and she in it, but she indicated the health department had already been out and tested the water for them, and they had no E. coli, and they were testing for um, acceptable levels of total coliform based on Ohio standards. And I'll share the test results a little bit later. She also shared that she and her partner are both college students. They have this four month old child and they're renting this property because they are from out of state. And this landlord him offered uh, the rental without a credit check. So this was what they felt they could afford and about the only thing that was available to them. So she, um, proceeded, I, I immediately scheduled an appointment and was upon my entry, I noticed um, the sulfur or rotten egg smell as soon as I walked in the house, although they didn't seem to be noticing it. Um, but she did share with me these photos. Uh, you can see the water running here is a little bit tinged in gray, but it is staining both during the running water and then on your right, you'll notice that it left the stain behind. So again, still the idea that maybe there's some manganese, although they had cleaned the sink, so I couldn't really get a good idea. I couldn't 
see it. I couldn't touch it. I couldn't get any kind of indication what was going on there. So um, went ahead and did the assessment and during the uh, visit and even prior to I had done some investigation and learned a few things that one most of the property is in the floodplain the septic um, upon walking around learned that it was upslope of the well which was a kind of a concern to me um, well casing was in a low pocket off just off the sidewalk before you got to the front door um, sediment they had installed a sediment filter on their treatment system because they had a softening system um, both the sediment filter and the treatment system had been installed by the handyman and within the last month um, that was installed the filter was installed and it resolved the issue for about two weeks uh, but I asked if either the renter or the property manager for the landlord had checked the filter, changed the filter, anything since the black had started showing up again. And, and the answer was no. And when the renter took me down to the basement where all of this was set up, um, there was no tools left behind for them to actually change the filter on their own. So they were dependent upon the property manager. Uh, additional things that I noted, um, even though there's not a plumbing code in Ohio for residential, the, the plumbing was very small diameter PVC, and I felt that it was rather poorly installed because there was areas where the piping would sag. So I had concern for stagnation, of accumulation of any contaminants that may be in, especially if they had iron or, and manganese, but also with the iron and calcium that is typical for the area. Uh, the plumbing was very hard to track in the area um, to determine if the outside spigot was treated or not because it was just um, a menagerie of both water and um, sewer lines and all the all the pipe was white and it just it was all comp very compact but I believe I believe that it was true. It was connected to the treatment system. The outside spigot was, even though that's where I ended up doing the testing. In addition, they had no backflow prevention. Uh, we talked about that with a child in the house uh, and backup power. There was none. So if they were left without power, they had no water and they had no good water besides, even if they did have power. Um, and no one, the property manager that they were texting, nor the residents had any idea the age of the components. So it was kind of a, a very unknown information um, regarding any of the components to get an idea what was going on. A property map to give you an idea of, where, of the kind of the situation. The light blue line on the right hand side is kind of a makeshift of. Uh, uh, floodplain boundary taken from some of the county maps, but they also had the fire pit. You can see the aeration system, and I'll talk about the unplugged part of it in a little bit. But uh, you can see that it, there is a, a somewhat of a separation distance from the well of the septic, but this property is not a large property to have uh, the required setbacks that are, are in Ohio's code. So when we did the walk around about outside, the first thing that we looked at was the well casing. Um, you can see in the picture there, the first thing that caught my eye is what I call the, the rope, which is a wick of bacteria, as I tell folks. Um, and also the conduit doesn't connect into the cap. The cap was not fully secure. So I the total coliform was a bit concerning. I was shocked that there was um, not higher levels because of the rope, but we uh, recommendations were to get that uh, taken care of, get the bracketing to hold the pump inside the well by a, a licensed uh, well driller or licensed plumber uh, based on the Ohio Department of Health uh, listing. Um, also, because of all the vegetation around the, this well, um, definitely recommended that they clean that up also get the soil volcanoed out in a way to reduce any ponding since this well did not have a well log so i wanted to reduce any potential for surface contamination that could be adding to that coliform level um, 
of course, there was recommendation then also, because this is a county with higher radon levels, to definitely get a vented cap and then make sure that the cap uh, is sealed, especially in that area where the conduit is not entering so that it would not be any kind of entry for further bacteria. Uh, the picture on the right, at the top of the right, is a picture of the septic. When we walked around, we found this. They had a nice access to their tank for clean out. They had electric, which told me this was an aeration system. And you can see at the bottom, I blew up my concern there, uh, which is the plug. It just hanging there. And if you could have seen it uh, like I could at the visit, you would have realized there's quite a bit of weathering on that plug. So I was questioning how long has this system not been plugged in? And could that be some of our issues that we're facing? Uh, so immediately, the I shared with the the resident, and they were taking notes and taking pictures. And I instructed them to contact the health department uh, as soon as they could about this. So they 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 did contact the health department um, uh, again, but we'll talk about that in a bit because their test results they had shared. Health department was very cooperative in this in this. Uh, event they provided information they were very um actively involved with c communicating with me about the recommendations i had and they had so that it all could be included in the set uh, in the assessment report that was written up following my visit but they had it has a history of, of coliform tests that go back to 2004 um, this in August, their E. coli was still clear, but st this time a numeric test was taken. Ohio's uh, acceptable level is 4.2 NPN, and this one came back with a 3.1. So it was within the acceptable level, although the health department shared with them that if they were a public system, they would have to be disinfecting. But since they're private, well, they didn't have to. This confused the resident highly as to why that statement was made. So that was a discussion I had with the health department. And then below you can see I uh, highlighted that most of the items are um, on the high end, what came back on the high end. Uh, their sulfates, which wasn't surprising with the rotten egg smell. Um, so that what didn't shock me. Total dissolved solids was on the higher side. Silica. Um, calcium and iron were both on the higher side, which is not unusual for this area because we have a, a limestone bedrock with um, high deposits of iron in our area. But my concern was a, a bit about manganese was alleviated when I saw these test results. Um, and then seeing the sodium being on the higher side, I again uh, went jumped back that I assume that the treatment was included in the water that was going to that outside faucet. So these were all, these all had some bells and whistles that went into the report, but um, continuing on, the renter had contacted the health department while I was looking at some of this and they were out. Uh, they also provided history of the septic on that property and they've had issues date, dating back as far as 1979 with septic also on this property, um, not always the same system. Uh, this system went in um, sometime in the mid eighties, I wanna say it was, uh, but you can see in the pictures below that the tank, which is the first picture on the left has solids nearly to the top. Uh, also an inspection port that was out between the tank and the the catch basin at the road and you can see that's pretty filled with solids and then in the catch basin on the far right the left uh, top corner of that catch basin has solids that we're also discharging directly out to it so this had been going on for some time the health department instructed the gals that they should be uh, locating alternative housing if they could um, they were going to condemn the house these gals being from out of state could not leave right away they didn't have anywhere to go so the health department just instructed them to use as little water as possible and to find alternative sources for showers and laundry 
And then, oh, of course, use bottled water because any water going through that system could cause a septic backup into the home at any time. So the end result, when I got this information and based on the test results is um, I referred them to one of our GLCAP programs that uh, focuses on finding um, and helping those that are homeless find proper housing. And in this instance, we needed a home that had safe source of water and sewer. They were accepted in that program. And in January, after they returned from the holidays, they were moved out of that home. The health department condemned that house until the septic can be replay, um, replaced or repaired or brought up to code at least. Um, they also um, had asked me the health department had asked me to definitely include the, a copy of the written assessment to the landlord as well as the renters asking me to do that because they felt that may be the only way that the landlord would take serious some of these um, issues and understand what needed to be done to make it livable for the next renter so um, I, I did accommodate that and did pass that on um, in the recommendations, I recommended that that well be jetted or cleaned to remove as much buildup of iron and calcium that could be harboring some of the total call form that was in the system. Um, of course, to get their septic cleaned and operational because they're under orders by the health department. Obtain that vented cap, have the conduit entry to the cap sealed so that they were completely um, under um, under under a sealed situation so that bacteria from the surface could not be impacting that well any more than what may already be from all the iron and back, uh, iron and um, sulfate that are, is in the water. Um, cleaning up the area around that casing and sloping the water out. And then I wanted, I really stressed on keeping good records so that they could can provide that to the next owner or uh, to the property manager so they know what they're dealing with with that well. So those that's um, pretty much what happened with this. And at that point, I will take questions at the end. So thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Um, it's great you found a solution for those folks. Uh, not to have water, it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so our next, uh, and we will do the questions at the end. So we have two more speakers. Uh, the next one is Joe Fields. Joe is a senior technical assistance provider at SIRCAP, the Southeast, the Southeast RCAP. And uh, he's a private well lead for SIRCAP and he's been uh, part of the RCAP organization for eight years. So with that, Joe. I all right, thank you, Steve. Uh, with the case we're dealing with, as we're talking about today, was with a lady in Kenswick, Virginia. She had had a well that was going in and out off and on, depends on what type of year or drought we were having. She had a system installed of 2,500 gallons. So when she actually had a water sample took on 33121, by the Virginia Household Water, Water Community Quality Program, we um, noticed that she had some high readings in her water. So as we took another test to find out if we could get a true test because a mix of truck water and well water made it very hard to get a true sample. So after pulling a true well sample, it was confirmed to have be good to drink, but still was high in sulfur and hardness, which we recommended a softener. Uh, we started digging around to look for a permanent solution or fix to the problem she was having, or having low water, you know, throughout the year, and why her cistern wasn't filling up properly. Next, please. Um, so as we were sitting around, me and the team were discussing ways of fixing the well or the price of a new well. It popped up about the hydrofracking. 
hydrofracking is something that I'd never heard of besides in oil fields. So I thought it was maybe a little strenuous of a task, but I was wrong. The technique involves high pressure water via the drilled well into the rock formation surrounding it. Hydrofracking may widen fractures in the bedrock and extend them further into the formation so it increases the net work of water bearing fractures, fissures, and supply waters to the well. It's a new technology out that's starting to come around in the well field. So if anyone can think of a reason to use it, it's a very good thing. Um, the day that we went down, well, excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't get ahead of myself. Um, when we really started exploring this whole idea was after our second truckload of water that we had delivered to her during the holidays to make sure the family had water through the holidays. And at first, we actually thought she might have had a crack or something in her cistern. So we kind of did a little exploratory and realized that it was water in the cistern, but it wasn't filling as fast as it should have. So after some more digging and, ex digging and work around, we um, said, okay, we'll have a backup plan on, on board for which would be having her local guy come out and feel her cistern you know, till, till it got warm enough to where we could go around the house. Well, when it got warm, the local delivery man was very locked up, jammed up and busy. So that proceeded to push us go a little faster on what we needed to do to help this client get some fresh, clean water in the house. And at $400 a pop to deliver water, we figured we could find another solution that would really help her out. So next slide, please. So the construction of the well was awarded to Foster's Drilling. They completed the project. It came out very nice. The client was happy. Sircat was happy, but we still had a problem dealing with the water. She said she still was having problems with the water not flowing and coming into the house all day. So the next step was for us to have an electrician come out and take a look at her wiring in her box. And we found out that she had a short in her electrical box that was causing her pump to kick on and off at different times of the night. So after doing another routine assessment, we were allowed to enter the home and we checked for running toilets, leaky sinks, anything like that that will cause it to keep cutting on and off. And it was discovered it was actually in the fuse box. So after the fracking, she went from one gallon or less to a gallon and a half and it was able to fill her cistern up without a problem. We have worked with Falter's Well Drilling Company on several jobs. So I would like to really thank them for the service that they provided to the client on such short notice. We also paid for this well to be fractured and anything else concerning this project through our Essential and Critical Needs Program grant and his Water and Life Fund. We were able to provide $4,000 to cover up for, cover the full cost of the project. Next slide, please. In the long term, the positive impact that increased the client's will whale production will be improvements of their quality of life through the increased environmental health and increased economic self-sufficiency. This project was positively impacted through the environmental health by one, increasing the volume of water produced by the well, providing the client with restored access to portable water. Two, preventing the financial burden which could have occurred. The financial assistance to cover the cost of the project had not been available. 
potentially have a negative impact on the client's mental and emotional being. As the current st status of this project right now, everything seems to be going quite well at this client's home. We are currently looking around and talking to some of her neighbors about seeing if we can help them acquire a water line from the town to their area what they would like to eventually hook up to and come off private wells. But as you know, I you know some of our private well owners enjoy their private wells and not being stuck to a, a bill. So hopefully the well will maintain its yield and we won't have to go that route. Last slide, please. This is a great picture of her land. It's very, very nice area, very tree. We had a lot of issues with creeping vines and stuff trying to get into her cistern. So it was advised for her to cut back any shrubs or bushes she might have near her cistern or well and just enjoy the clean, fresh water that she's been given right now. And hopefully we won't have to do anything else to the well. And it's this project was to help to help self-sufficiency from the rest of the crowd. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Joe. Um, great. Um, we have one more, and then we can get to the questions. And so um, our last speaker on the panel is uh, Michelle Code. Uh, Michelle provides technical assistance to rural communities in Maine, primarily around drinking water, wastewater, and private well issues. Uh, she has a BS in chemical engineering from Maine and is a grade two water treatment operator. So with that, Michelle, it's all yours. In your program today, uh, really enjoyed a lot of the, uh, the sessions. So I'm happy to be with you. I wanted to start this well assessment presentation um, a little bit maybe differently <laughs> um, because we do so much technical assistance uh, in our communities and um, probably most of you like myself are a little bit of a, a technical junkie. And when we do these private well assessments, it's, it's not at all like going and meeting with a water professional or a municipal board member or a water operator. Um, the private well owners are um, seeking our guidance on a whole different level. This is a very personal um, venture for them. And uh, I, I really find it very refreshing uh, when I meet with these private well owners and their very keen interest in understanding and knowing more about water because this is not their field. So I wanted to start this um, presentation with this uh, lovely piece of artwork um, that was um, just a little print of it um, given to me by this uh, participant. This uh, person I helped, she's an 80 year old woman who has been a resident of her uh, little um, spot in the woods in Western Maine for 40 years. Back in the 60s and 70s when there was such a back to the earth movement, we had a lot of uh, people coming from cities in Southern New England and uh, wanting to live closer to the earth. And, and that was Joe's story. Her and her partner came to Maine and uh, they carved out their little spot in the woods and it's their sanctuary. Uh, their property came with a deeded right of way to a spring across the road from them. And for 40 years, Joe has loved the cool, sweet water, as she referred to it, from the spring. And uh, so I just wanted to start with that kind of personal perspective on this um, particular well assessment or spring assessment, which turned into a well assessment. Uh, in August of 2021, I got a call from an infectious disease nurse at the Maine CDC. And she was looking for some assistance investigating a suspect water supply that had been linked to a cluster of illness. There were about a dozen people hospitalized, and the source was a spring. 
and it supplied uh, both a roadside tap and as it turned out, uh, this one, it had two lines from the spring. One came out at the roadside. The other one was gravity fed to Joe's home. And that was her deeded uh, water supply uh, for 40 years. So on Joe's 80th birthday, uh, she started a nine day bout with a severe uh, diarrhea and uh, her stool tested presumptive positive for Campylobacter. And at the same time, uh, they were having a lot of people uh, show up at the hospital with gastrointestinal problems. Uh, and like I said, about a dozen people were hospitalized. So um, the infectious disease nurse, uh, you know, gave me Joe's contact information and, and said she is a real little dynamo. She's a spitfire. She has been a very active member of her community for 40 years. and. Um, she is really kind of just beside herself right now. Uh, she's been on her own for a few years, and uh, this bout of illness really um, set her back quite a bit. So I got a hold of Joe and I said, uh, you know, let's get together. Let's see what we can learn about how you got sick and, and what can we do about it. So I met Joe at her home, and uh, she very spryly led me up the... Uh, wooded path across the road to the spring. And as you can see in the bottom picture, the spring box um, comes up a little bit out of this uh, depression in the ground it sits in. It's uh, on the side of a hill. That, that picture doesn't show really uh, the grade of that hill very well, but it's, it's, it's a fairly good hillside so you know during heavy rains there's a lot of runoff coming down here there was water pooled outside the spring box and i did take the cover off and look inside and you could see the level inside and the level outside were pretty much in equilibrium um, i was pretty well convinced from what i saw inside the spring box and outside the spring box that um, the infiltration and the communication uh, both in and out of the spring box was um, pretty consistent. Um, there was a fair amount of debris, there's moss growing on it, nothing was aerialed, there was a little bit of root intrusion, some dead bugs, um, stuff like that. And you can see in the top right picture there, uh, two black plastic lines, uh, neither of them screened no filter, no nothing. Uh, one goes down to the roadside tap and one went to Joe's house. The town clerk had posted a boil water notice at the roadside tap and they were in the process of trying to uh, locate the property owner. It turned out the property owner was uh, an aged ill gentleman living about three hours away um, he was not really um, in a, I think, physical and mental health um, position to get involved in this project. And uh, there was no decision made to um, disable the roadside tap or to um, discontinue it in any way. Uh, so the town has kept the boil water order notice posted there. In the state of Maine, if you have a roadside tap, a spring or, or other water source on your property, that you're not advertising and encouraging people to use, it is not considered a public water system and it's not regulated. Um, if, you, if someone put a sign here and said, this is great water, help yourself, um, then it becomes a public water system. It's regulated and it's regularly monitored, but this was not. As far as Joe knew, um, for the 40 years she had been using the water, had never been tested. And um, she did say that occasionally she had a salamander plop out of the faucet because <laughs> there wasn't any screening or filtering or anything all the way down into her house. So this is her lovely little cottage in her uh, little nook in uh, the woods of Western Maine. And um, it's uh, the whole home is down 
grade uh, from the location of the spring across the road. I'm trying to remember the distance. I think it was uh, 300 to 500 feet. Uh, I'd have to look at my map that I made up, but I don't have that with me right now. Um, so it gravity fed down to the house and uh, in her basement, she has a booster pump. She said she never even had to turn the booster pump on because uh, all the pressure through the through the house, which is really just a kitchen and bathroom just above the basement, uh, was all maintained, you know, simply because it was um, at a gradient below the uh, water source. So she thought this was fabulous. I mean, it does sound fabulous. What could be better? Uh, gravity feed and she had good water pressure and all of that. Um, since she had uh, been ill, her and a neighbor had uh, done a test at her kitchen tap and it was positive for E. coli. And uh, she had been uh, drinking and cooking with bottled water and uh, she had been boiling water to wash her dishes. And uh, she said, uh, you know, it was time to, you know, she didn't want to be sick like that again. It was time for her to look for a solution. We talked about uh, the options really being treatment or a different source. Um, she was convinced that um, the spring was not in good condition. Nobody was going to maintain it. And uh, even if she put treatment in, she didn't want to rely on that water source anymore. And she wanted to look into um, having a well drilled. So we got a couple of proposals. And of course, uh, last summer was our second summer of drought in Maine and well drillers were uh, spread thin and in high demand. Uh, but we did contract with one and it was December when they were able to come and drill. Um, I wasn't there on the day that they drilled. They did uh, drill just over 100 feet away from her leach field. <laughs> She's got about 20 acres there. I, I wish they would have um, maybe uh, put the well in a little bit better location than they did, but I think the name of the game was get in, get out, get it done, and this was, um, you know, technically far enough away from her leach field and uh, a place they could get their rig in and out of quickly and easily. So it's uh, kind of just off her, um, the side of her house. And uh, they did put a nice sanitary seal cap on it. There's a raw water tap inside. There is no treatment, uh, not even a filter, uh, pressure tank and onto her distribution system. The well driller did um, whatever they consider to be their uh, standard uh, disinfection procedure of the well. And uh, depending on uh, who I talked to on different days, uh, I really had a hard time getting a clear picture of their procedure. And I, I think it was a little seat of the pants-ish. So I wasn't totally surprised when um, we tested the water and it was still positive for total coliform. It was negative for E. coli at that time. Um, the well, I don't think there was any real reason to believe the well had an E. coli problem. Um, and I think it probably just had some total coliform bacteria, um, potentially from uh, you know putting the pump in. Or what I really think it is, is that her distribution system in her home was um, had a stubborn uh, contamination from the years of, of use of the spring. The other thing we noticed in her test, her iron was slightly high, um, which is really considered a secondary contaminant, an aesthetic issue. But uh, she also had slightly elevated pH. Her pH was above eight. So when the uh, disinfecting procedure didn't work the first time, her plumber offered to disinfect again, which he did. And I wasn't uh, directly involved in it. I know he used household bleach. I called the uh, the well driller to see how they did their procedure. I got a few different stories and um, I told Joe that I, I thought we really needed to use a, a buffered product because of the high pH that the household bleach um, just wasn't effective at that pH range. She was pretty overwhelmed. She was also dealing with a cracked vertebrae at the time. Um, so uh, the idea of 
you know, lugging a hose around in and out of her basement, checking stuff, opening and closing uh, taps. And, and, you know, the whole disinfecting procedure was kind of overwhelming for her, even if she had people helping. She'd always been so independent. It was really hard for her to accept all this help. Um, but uh, I, I managed to steer her away from just... Um, resigning herself to installing continuous disinfection. I said, let's do this one more time. Let's do it right. Let's get a buffered product. I talked with a treatment specialist and a licensed operator because I'm not really used to, uh, you know, following this procedure this closely. And, uh, you know, different, the plumber volunteered to come and help. And this was right around Christmas time. You know, our, this disinfection procedure spanned Christmas. And he helped, um, with the disinfection procedure. The other people I spoke with, they um, offered some uh, chlorine test strips so we could really, really verify that as we charged all of the distribution system, we got it all charged with a good 200 parts per million of, of uh, chlorine solution. And the thing that I found amazing, having not participated firsthand in one of these procedures is how long you really need to do the circulation step to get that chlorination really um, mixed well, because it clearly did flow in that uh, recirculation loop, just like plug flow. If we were sampling and testing the chlorine uh, strips um, as it was flowing, you would, you would have good concentration and a couple of minutes later, it was gone. And it took many hours of the circulating to get that consistent enough so that we knew when we shut everything down that it um, was fully charged in her home throughout all of her distribution lines with a good uh, concentration of, of uh, sodium, hydro, hydro, uh, sodium hypochlorite. So that was a real eye opener for me. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just one of those things I'll never forget. And I'll never think casually about well shocking again. So, okay, I guess I'm a slide behind here because I've already told everything on this one. Yeah, there was 40 years of bacterial contamination. There was elevated pH and it took three times of doing the disinfection procedure. And, uh, yeah, back to Joe living serenely in her lovely wooded uh, haven in Western Maine. And after 40 years, she has safe drinking water at last. So, um, you know, we, like I said, we see a lot of different things and we get very focused on a lot of the technical aspects in our, in our assistance. And um, I really love doing the private well assessments because they make it so personal and you really see the face of the public uh, that you're helping. So um, I really enjoy it and I enjoy sharing the story and happy to answer questions with everybody else at the end here. Thank you. Well, thanks, Michelle. So we'll bring everybody up. Um, <laughs> Katie had a question. I'm, I'm just going to read. I'm not going to put it on the screen. It's kind of long. So it said, question for everyone in the panel. Did any of these well owners uh, in these stories reach out to you for private well testing or a well assessment prior to their serious issue? Just wondering about how they heard about RCAP in the first place. Yeah. I can comment on that. Um, we sometimes advertise. We also um, advertise when we do uh, private well trainings for homeowners. And in this particular case, like I said, I was contacted by the infectious disease nurse because there was a problem. But we do trainings and at the trainings, we always mention the private well assessments and we get a, a lot of response from people who are, are just interested in knowing more about owning a well, maintaining a well, protecting a well and uh, their water quality. Um, I can address that also. Um, we we promote to, with health departments, um, with the realtors across state of Ohio, at least, and some of the other states, we do a little of that. Um, but 
we we get a lot of recognition from Google searches of people looking for assistance with their wells through a Google search because we have private well listed in our website. It comes up regularly. So um, sometimes we get for other regions. So I know I've passed some to Joe and I probably passed some to Michelle. <laughs> so we, we do get for other regions and we gladly connect them with the right people. Yeah, I do the same thing. I, I mentioned it on every one of our webinars and probably about every other one, at least one person asks for a name and I ship it to you guys. So, um, okay. So uh, springs are a hot topic, which I knew it would be. It was, you know, so we, I want to mention we had Judy Manners from Tennessee Department of Health give a presentation on Springs and some work she was doing in Tennessee back in 2017 at her conference. And that video is on YouTube on our YouTube channel. But uh, the question today is, uh, which is a tough one, uh, any tips to convince people that roadside springs may not be safe to drink? Signs often disappear and social media does not help. Um, and I think you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. Joe, you're muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Here in Virginia, we have a couple of black natural roadside springs, and they literally have three or four foot plaques on them that's into the granite. It, you see people sitting on the side of the road with jugs and jugs and jugs just filling them up so that one's going to take a little bit common more common sense well and people just swear by it because they've always used it but i gotta admit i've heard a lot about springs in my day but i've never heard of a salamander coming out of somebody's tap <laughs> so, that should be a telltale sign in my in my opinion so um okay um i and i that's that's the questions uh anyone else have uh I'm looking here um, anything else anybody want to add? Um, great stories, uh, really interesting. Um, I think the assessment program really speaks for itself as far as the number of people we help and what Michelle said about the one-on-one, -on -one, there's no replacing that because even if a well owner is skeptical or think you're trying to sell them something or whatever, by the time it's over with, they realize um, you don't get that kind of personal attention very often in this world today. And so uh, the assessments are really a great way to uh, build up that um, personal communication and community and uh, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, someone just commented, this is a great program and well owners really get a great education. So, yeah, those are great stories. Um, anything else you may want to add before we move on? You guys are all big talkers, I'm telling you. <laughs> I guess one thing, Steve, that to share is, you know, we do group trainings um, for homeowners, but everyone that's ever attended a training that's gone on to request an assessment after tells more of, of the value, the great value, because everyone's situation is a little bit different. And so the one on one can't be beat. It, it's it helps them out. And it op allows them to open up when they don't want to open up around other people and let sure. them know their potential situation. Oh, and that's for sure. Because usually you hear from well owners when they have an issue. Um, and that's that's unfortunate. Um, that's an, the other thing in the attitudes thing we've been talking about over the last three days that needs to change is that well owners need to become proactive and not reactive, and uh, which is really where it's at. So, um, well, thank you all very much. Uh, it was interesting to hear from you all and uh, thanks for what you do, so.